The hounds of which you spoke, they followed you here. Followed? Impossible. There was only one left, and it... However, Brox then interrupted Malfurion's bumblings. Fell beasts. The dark magic. Where there was one, there can be more, if they're able to feed. Brox then instinctively reached for a war axe that he didn't have. I've nothing to fight with. You'll be armed. You'll find many branches lying around. Find one the length of your favoured weapon. Malfurion, attend me. Brox went ahead and did as he was told. Now, as a little aside, Ronin had been quietly struggling with some internal strife. Crisis had made it quite clear that the two of them should not interact too much with the past. To best preserve the lives of those he loved, the wizard really shouldn't do or say anything. So that was his plan. But anyway. Kneel before it, my student. You too, warrior. Malfurion, place your hands upon the branch. Brox, place your palms atop his hands. Now, clear your mind, warrior, of all but the weapon. I will guide you more when that is done. Both Malfurion and Brox did those things, placing their hands atop each other. This is gay. Shh. Keep rubbing the shaft. Immediately, a primal force bullied its way into Malfurion's mind, but after collecting himself, the young night elf accepted Brox's thoughts and let the image of what the warrior wanted take shape in his mind. Can you see the weapon, my student? Sense the feel of it. I do. As well as seeing the weapon, Malfurion could also feel the orc's relationship to it. It was more than just a simple tool. It was a true extension of a warrior. Guide your hands over the wood. Follow the natural grain and turn it into the shape desired. So, the night elf, with big old chunky orc hands atop his own, ran his fingers along the branch, feeling the wood shift. And then, boof, the branch was a war axe all of a sudden or something. The task is done. Return to us. Malfurion and Brox then opened their eyes, awkwardly avoiding eye contact with each other, while Cenarius studied the newly formed weapon. Let it always swing true. Always protect its master. Let it be wielded well for the cause of life and justice. As the Forest Lord spoke, the axe started to glow, and then... It's yours. It will serve you well. So the Orc accepted the gift, swinging it back and forth a few times just to test the quality. It's... The balance is perfect, like a part of my arm. But it's made of wood. It's gonna crack. Now, in addition to Malfurion's work, it has my blessing. You'll find it stronger than any mortal forged axe. You can trust me on that. The first fell beast then pounced into shot, and Cenarius stepped forward, unleashing what can only be described as a miniature sun. However, instead of striking it dead, the beast absorbed it. It then shivered a little bit in arousal, and then immediately split into two fell beasts. Those two fell beasts then charged the Forest Lord, whilst two more arrived and rushed towards Brox. And still, Ronin just stood there. What could he do anyway? Magic obviously wasn't going to help. He had sword skills, yes, but no sword. And it was probably a bit too late to ask Cenarius for a weapon now. Brox let out a huge war cry that actually managed to startle one of the fell beasts, and the orc jumped on that hesitation, swinging his new axe, which cut deep into the beast's flesh. Meanwhile, Malfurion unleashed a violent typhoon, blasting his target, knocking it back, and reducing its movement speed by 50% for six seconds or something. He then asked the surrounding trees for the gift of whatever spare leaves they had to offer, and within moments, hundreds descended from above, pouring into the whirlwind. That combination acted as a sort of nature blender, cutting and slashing the fell beast into nothing but a green, glowy paste of goo. And again, Ronin just kind of stood there. Everyone else seems to have this pretty much covered, he thought. But, as the wizard observed Brox, a pretty shit thought popped into his head. Ronin had figured out that if he and Crisis could not be returned to their time, they'd most likely have to die, to ensure that time wasn't completely buggered. But neither of them had counted on a single orc warrior also being thrown into this era. An orc warrior that was very much interacting with the past, and playing very fast and loose with it. So, Ronin was now contemplating the fact that he needed to deal with that orc warrior, quickly. Perhaps in the midst of this chaos, no one would notice if the orc suddenly dropped dead from a magic spell to his back. But Ronin then shook his head, pushing back that shitty thought and realising he was being a dick. And finally, in that moment, he also realised he really needed to stop just standing around doing nothing. The wizard rushed forward, recalling the incantation that had helped him countless times in the Third War, 
It was a perfectly acceptable offensive spell that would at least wound the fell beast he was currently focusing on. However, what he actually unleashed was a wall of raging fire, which burned every single visible demon to ash in an instant. And then there was silence. Rox dropped his axe, his mouth wide in sheer disbelief, whilst Malfurion stared at Cenarius, as if to say, are you sure that wasn't you that did that? This was not the first time this had happened, Ronan thought. Something similar had happened back when he and Krasis first arrived in this era, in the forest. But Ronan wasn't given much time to feel really pleased with himself, because a sudden excruciating pain shot through his back. It felt as if his very soul was being drained away. Brox and Malfurion rushed towards him, yelling something about yet another fell beast, but Ronin then passed out. Meanwhile, Duranda made her way through the corridors of the temple, past countless chambers of sleeping acolytes. However, the sentry appeared out of nowhere. Sister, you really should stay in your quarters and get some sleep. You've hardly had any rest for days. Your friend will be alright. I'm certain of it. They were obviously talking about Illidan, who Tyrande was somewhat worried about, but to be honest, her concerns were for someone else. I hope he realises how much you care for him. Time for your choosing's fast approaching, isn't it? Those words bothered Tyrande a lot, so she brushed past the bemused guard and walked out of the temple, only to find Lord Ravencrest, his men and Illidan just now arriving back from their venture. Well, if it isn't the most lovely of the Mother Moon's dedicated servants. How interesting to find you awaiting our return despite the late hour. Very interesting, don't you think, Illidan? The commander smiled and winked towards his new personal sorcerer. Yes, my lord. We must make for Blackrook Hold, sister. But I think I can spare a precious moment for you two. Ravencrest guided the rest of the party away, leaving Tyrande and Illidan alone with darkened face cheeks. They're safe, Tyrande. Lord Ravencrest has taken me under his wing. We fought a fearsome beast, and I destroyed it with my own power. Malfurion escaped. You're certain of it? Of course, of course. Illidan waved away any further questions about his brother. I found my destiny, Tyrande. The Moonguard all but ignored me, but I slew a monster that killed several of theirs. Tyrande wanted to hear more about Malfurion and the Orc, but obviously Illidan was caught up in his own fantasticness at the moment. It was understandable, though. He had spent a long time working very hard and fruitlessly to achieve the glorious future so many had predicted for him. I'm glad for you. I feared that you were frustrated with the pacing of Cenarius' teachings, but it seems they've come in handy. What? No, I didn't use those slow, cumbersome spells that Malfurion's adored Shando shows us again and again. I used good traditional night elf sorcery. It was exhilarating. Illidan! I have to go, Tyrande. I am to be shown my place at the Hold, then organize a larger party to retrieve the dead beasts and all the bodies. Bodies? The creatures wiped out the original pursuit to a single soldier, Duranda. There was a weird tone to Illidan's voice, almost gleeful. The sorcerers perished immediately, no help at all, and yet I killed one creature with just a spell. Illidan! Illidan then grabbed Duranda's hand and kissed it, before suddenly murmuring, I wanted to be worthy of you, and soon I will be." And then he buggered off, leaving a very confused and kinda pissed off Tyrande behind.